20s, I was really a traveler. I saw myself as a bit of a global citizen, and I was very experienced as a backpack traveler. And I think I really saw journalism as an extension of my love of culture and learning about people's stories. And so without really any formal training, I went out into the world and just began to document the stories that I was hearing and had a small degree of success selling those stories to local papers and eventually wound up with my own column in the Red Deer Advocate, which is my hometown newspaper. Right. I think that people in central Alberta um, were really taken into my stories, which were always human interest type stories, focusing on the people who were really affected by wars in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. But I think it's important to say that without that really key step of having the formal training, um, having the education to back it up, I it, there was there was very low probability that I was ever going to really make a name for myself as a journalist. And I'm not sure that I ever really wanted to. I loved traveling so much, and I, lo I loved the people's stories, and I have always had this humanitarian heart. Um, and so that's how journal, that's how, that's what journalism was to me. Um, but of course, working and living in these, these conflict environments like Afghanistan and Iraq, um, I mean, it's very stressful. And the things that you see day in and day out, you know, I was freelancing um, for a number of different television stations um, in 2008. And the things I was seeing that year in Iraq were incredibly disturbing. And things, images that I still carry with me today, I think that a person has to be very um, prepared when they go into those sort of environments. They have to have a pretty clear understanding of what it is they're going into because it's not fun and games. In fact, it's it's not really fun at all. It's, it's very serious. It's very sad. It's very... Um, disturbing what you intake day after day after day in those environments. I guess your appetite for risk sort of increases too because you become conditioned to those environments. I lived in Iraq for almost eight months and so when I went to Somalia against the advice of many of my colleagues I thought to myself well how much worse could it really be than Baghdad but I was wrong. I had never been to a place like Somalia before and um, though I wasn't naive entirely about the situation, there's a lot more research that I should have done, and I should have listened to the um, advice of my colleagues. When I was kidnapped, I faced the often harsh criticism of the Canadian media who questioned whether or not I should be in Somalia at all. And when I came home at the end of 2009, I recognized the truth in that. In fact, I was underqualified. Though I was very experienced as a traveler, I wasn't especially experienced as a journalist. And an environment like Somalia is very complicated um, and very dangerous. And you never think that it will happen to you. You know you can read about it happening to other people, the kidnappings and the killings, but you don't think it'll happen to you. And it happened to me. Um, so I have a very different perspective on that now. I think that the role of journalists in these war-torn environments is extremely important. It is so important that the world understands what is going on in these troubled um, places. But it's also important that the journalists there are there with both eyes wide open, with full understanding, and with safety precautions in place. Things like kidnap and ransom insurance, which I didn't have in 2008. And the result of that was my family lost everything when I was kidnapped. So if you're a freelancer and you don't um, have the, the protection of a major uh, media outlet in case a worst case situation unfolds, you better have kidnap and ransom insurance because it's the people that you love the most in the world that will lose everything. That's just the reality. Right. Um, and that's something that I hadn't given a whole lot of thought.